Well, Brian, thanks for being on the show. You want, tell me a little bit about Nuvalex and you and what you guys are up to. Uh, yeah, well, Dave, thanks for having me. Um, Nuvalex is a ISV out of Palo Alto, California, so kind of the heart of the valley, uh, Silicon Valley. And we built uh, what I call a multi-tenant um, XAAS management platform um, targeting the service providers, so MSPs, SIs. And basically what it, all that means is we built a platform that heavily automates provisioning, deprovisioning, and daily administration. Uh, today for all things Microsoft Cloud, so M365 Azure into and all that, but going well beyond that. Um, you know, the platform is really intended for service providers to make it really easy for them to uh, remediate the service requests that come in every day through the service desk, but really focus around the cloud, right, around public cloud. Um, so it, I guess it would be the cloud version of uh, maybe what you would consider what an RMM tool is. Okay. So the context for listeners is you pinged me with exactly the kind of catnip that gets my attention. So for all you, if any of you PR people out listening is come to me with a forward thinking set of statements, that's what perks my attention. You threw me a blog, which I will, I've included the link in the show notes and description here for, for those listening that was talking about multi SaaS management yeah. and the thinking you have, and I wanted to start with this idea of you, you, the context where you'd said the, the COVID-19, the accelerant that we keep talking about, yeah. caused service providers to quickly realize there was no reason, no, no longer any reason to continue to recommend anything on premises to their customer base. Everything could be done in the cloud and you meant everything. So our, the, the, before we get into multi-SaaS, are you confidently declaring like, on-premises is dead, gone forever? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and the reason being is that, um, you know, everything has their natural life, right? And, and it really depends on the organization and how they view cloud and their rate of change and what they're willing to do and the partners they work with. Um, I think it's inevitable that uh, a majority of the world will run on cloud over time. You know, the question is nobody really knows what that time is. And also, too, it depends on the organization. I mean, some orgs, um, they feel the need to keep certain things on premise. Other orgs are like, really, there's no need for me to keep a, a, an on premise environment up and running when everything I need to do from an operational standpoint in my organization, I can do it in the cloud. So if it's easier for you, it's easier for me. Why wouldn't we make that transition now? That's fair. So, but it, anything new is likely just to be cloud, though. Because there's, I mean, it will, right? I mean, I, I believe that because because uh, it can be, and it's just you know you, you're you're removing a lot of what I, what I consider to be kind of um, traditional on-premise administrative complexity for the customer and the service provider. So the cloud has the ability to make everyone's lives a hell of a lot easier from a from a pure administration standpoint. Right? But I think what's then happening is is that this accelerant, the move we've had, we've had huge cloud adoption this calendar year, 2020. We can definitely say like we that's all ramped up. We're seeing explosive growth on that. Threw everybody to rework from home. Everyone's connecting through things in the cloud. And you've then offered that the entire IT community has come to the stark realization that RMM vendors or a new category of independent service vendor, ISV, right. needs to help organize administration of a cloud managed world. So I'm the first one to go, absolutely. I 100% am on board with this, uh, but what needs to happen here? What's the what's the piece, the gap that you think is missing? Well, it's a couple of things, right? Uh, you know, number one, the, the um, service provider community, and for this conversation, we'll just use MSPs um, to make it simple. Um, they've always had a set of tools that they rely on to manage their customer, right? And, and all the stuff that their customers are consuming from an IT perspective. Um, now they find themselves moving more and more of their customers into these different workloads, whether it's M365 or Slack or Box or whatever. It's like, hey, it'd be really cool if I had kind of this easy, you know, single pane of glass tool to manage all these different workloads that are in the cloud, kind of like I had on prep, you know? And we kind of termed that what we call cloud RMM for lack of a better way to say it, but it's the concept of remote management of cloud-based applications. And, you know, when you look at those two worlds in the world of traditional RMM and what we call cloud RMM, the entities in terms of what uh, is to be managed on a, on a regular basis change, right? I mean, it goes from a lot of this infrastructure-based, 
you know, te- you know, IT stuff that needs to be managed to really more around user lifecycle management. The users and the applications are consuming because all these applications are running on some infrastructure, whether it's Azure, AWS, whatever it is. So the concept of having a bunch of infrastructure that they need to pay attention to kind of really doesn't apply as much. There may be situations where you have, whether it's AD servers or some specific service dedicated to certain things that's unique to that organization. But in general, from a you know standard operating procedure, you know, a lot of stuff goes away. And, and so what historically, I think, and as I look back, is what has been important and what needs to be managed in an organization. Uh, I feel like there's just a really, really big shift happening. And, you know, I also feel in talking with all the MSPs we talk to, it's like they kind of look back and say, hey, you know, you guys, we've been using your tools forever. We love them, but uh, we need your tools to do the following things. And what do you got? You know, well, that's and, I mean, I think that's the question, because so I I say this, you, you call it the stark realization. I'll go, yeah, but we haven't had this for years and we've needed it. Why haven't we had it before? Why why has this been? Why, why don't we have it yet? I think there was no there's no major when I say major catalyst to drive the new behavior. And, and I, you know, everybody, you know, probably myself included beats COVID to death. But I mean, the world has changed in terms of how people work and remote is the new norm. And it's it quite honestly, I believe it's not changing back. I would even argue that, you know, people say, well, you know, there'll be a hybrid model. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, there'll be some component of that, but you're not going to see things going back to the way they were. Uh, my organization, my virtual organization can adopt that has no on-premise component that can be much more easily managed in a remote workforce. That's what we're going to use. And, and literally, I don't know what you can't get um, that you historically have leveraged on-prem that does now exist in the cloud. So what's the point? You stated making the statement that the RMM vendors or a new category. Yeah. All right. Which is it? Which is going to do this? Uh, so let me answer it this way. Uh, there are obviously guys starting to pop up in, in our world and what we do, guys like us. Um, I personally think the RMM guys are best positioned to support this under ideal circumstances, meaning they have the technology. Right. Um, I believe it's theirs to lose their business to lose um, because they already have the customers. They're already using their tools to remote manage. Um, but the question becomes how many of them are equipped and have the tools now or in the near future to solve what is becoming a much, much bigger problem today. And it's not going to slow down. So I don't know if it's a direct answer to your question, but um, um, there is a, I believe a, significant inflection point in the market right now and um it's very disruptive to that world and uh some of the guys in that world of traditional rmm are going to be able to transition the question is how many and will they be able to do it soon enough okay i'll make the prediction then and you can tell me where 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 the stumbling points would this be so i believe the answer to that question is zero i believe that the established rmm players can't because they're unable to deal with the innovators dilemma on this and deal with the dips to their existing revenue the amount that they've got to transfer from their existing revenue because they're going to have to you know sacrifice themselves to innovate to the next pieces and particularly if they've taken PE money or yeah, or their public, their ownership structure simply won't allow that. So my statement is, is none of them are going to make it. I think they're going to get disrupted by an ISV. And I guess in, rather than make you, uh, make you sort of you know, challenge me or d- d- discount, I'll, I'll phrase it this way. What would be the conditions that allow them to make that jump and make it? It would be interesting to hear the conversations going on in all these boardrooms. They have to see this. They have to see this. This is a significant point, I believe, in all these organizations' lives in this particular industry. Um, I, I, I really just feel the market shifted really quick. And you're right. You're 100% right where the new, the new world of, you know, and I'm by no means an RMM expert, but is how we think about remote management and and tools for service providers, it's just a different model too. It's not just a different product, it's a different business model. It's, you know, the traditional model, I question whether that can sustain itself. 
uh, in, in this new world of two dot, what I call 2.0. Um, I don't know. And, and the reality is, you know, a lot of great companies uh, have cannibalized existing businesses to, to get to that, that new world of how business is done in the next generation of products and technologies. And that's a tough thing to do, you know, in terms of making that decision. That's not something that you can do lightly as an organization because of what's at stake. But then you have to ask yourself the question, what if I don't? Right. Well, that's, that is the big question. Now, in, in this case, uh, service providers are actually going to be, you know, they're also stuck right now. So they're waiting for this gap to get filled in. What do you, th- if you th- you've come up with this idea of RMM 2.0, and I'm going to ask on this a little bit, like, what does it need to do from your perspective to meet this gap? So what I think of RMM 2.0, I really feel like it's a it's an environment that an RMM vendor would provide where if I'm a service provider and I'm dealing with any customer, depending on the customer and what workloads they're managing or what resources they're managing, to me, you know, RMM 2.0 or what I call also hybrid RMM, which I should be able to jump jump back and forth between those two worlds and manage what I need to match from that same pane of glass. Sure. It should I shouldn't care. Like if, if I have, you know, one customer that has everything in, in you know, uh, in the cloud, I should be able to, from that same pane of glass, manage all the, the, the applications that their users are consuming and whatnot, whether it's devices, infrastructure, applications. But, you know, I have another customer that has a bunch of resources still on-prem. I can just go from one customer to the next customer and start managing the on-prem environment with simple mouse clicks. To me, that's, that's, that's RMM 2.0, that's hybrid RMM, but it's like, you're unifying those worlds. You know, you have to be the bridge for those. You know, I, to me, ideal because if you talk to service providers, they don't want to manage 20 tools. Give right. me a tool that integrates these worlds, unifies these worlds, simple to use, hand off to my service desk guys, remediate majority of service requests. No matter what customer, no matter what environment they're in, push buttons, remediate, move on. You know, and yeah, maybe it's a bit of nirvana. And oh, by the way, put a layer on a layer of security on top of that to protect my customer and their data, you know, protect from internal threats, external threats, you know, Armin 2.0 uh, to us is, it's a big, it's, it's a big platform. It's a big play. And to me, that also keeps your partners from venturing off to find other platforms to do a piece of work that, that I believe could easily be handled by the RMM vendors. Yeah. I think you've sort of said it, said it well too, that this is a Nirvana and a target more than an achievable goal. I think the idea you're still, these tools are about reducing complexity. If you take, and cloud opens up so much more complexity because you're going to add, you're gonna add you know, five to 10 times the number of providers that you might have used versus an on-premises solution. So I may not get to the Nirvana of one perfect plane of glass you know, besides the browser, uh, that, that, but if I've still reduced by a factor of two, by a factor yeah. of three, by Perfect. a factor of, right, you're still getting a whole lot closer and can do the management necessary. The, the good news about this, this market in general, the MSP market is you're selling a bunch of technical people, which is great, right? Because it almost, in a weird way, it's like, hey, you kind of, it kind of forgives some sense, right? If your product's not perfect, get a bunch of really smart people on the other end. They're like, ah, don't worry about it. You know, they all have this attitude like, ah, we're really sure smart. We'll figure it out. But give me something to help me get closer, you know? And that's that's the cool thing about the, what I love about the community is you're working with a bunch of really sharp people that get it. And, and, and as long as you can show them that there is a path and you're making some significant strides to get into that end goal, it's a great community to sell to because they want to get you there. They want to help you get there. So it's really, it's a cool market to be in. And I'm, I feel like you have to have this vision. You have to do this. You know, I mean, you've got like, as an RMM vendor, I got to keep these customers, you know, every one customer that veers off your platform to go find a solution, a different application to manage the cloud is one customer you get to worry about if they will ever come back. If this is the big direction and this is the way that it's all going, what would be your one piece of advice then for a solution provider to prepare or to help if you know or, or to or to gear up to make multi SaaS management you know that achieve closer to a fully achieved goal what's the, what the solution providers can do by at least having the capability to manage the microsoft stack you know cross cross tenant and automation in in conjunction with the um, 
with your existing environment and your customers and, you know, leveraging your RMM capabilities in that world is a good start. Um, but even if you look at the MSP community and what Microsoft's doing, you know, it's only a matter of time, you know, where the service margins are dropping and reselling, uh, you know, Microsoft licenses and whatnot. And, you know, everybody sees Microsoft as it, it's, it's an interesting thing because, you know, you want to get close to them, but you don't want to get run over by them. And they're getting a lot more capable these days and, all, you know, in, in these areas. So there's a lot of great products, a lot of great ISVs out there that build best in class technologies that also MSPs are excited about to bring to their customers. That all has to get managed. Yeah. You know, stuff is getting really complex. And, and we think about a service provider. And at the end of the day, if they're going to make money, it's real simple. What you deliver the service for versus what you charge for the service, you try to make that gap as big as possible, which means you have to drop your service delivery costs at a point where the only way you can do that is through service automation. So, you know, service automation is at the core of that next generation. And, and I truly believe that uh, if, if our vendors find a way to uniquely tie those worlds together in, in, an, in a way that makes it almost seamless for the service provider, Man, I just think it's going to keep doing. Well, I'll, I'll close by saying I think I think it's going to happen. The question is who's going to do it, and that's the, yeah, that's that's a the lot of stake. Right, there's a lot at stake here. There's a clearly identified need, and those that step in and deliver here are going to be the ones that win. But the good news, from my perspective, is is that the, either way, the service providers will win because somebody's going to do it. Going to deliver the capability, and then all the providers win on the on the back end. Yeah, I mean, look, guys like us are out there. We're building that next generation technology. I mean, we can't solve your on prem management stuff. There are guys that have already done that, but we sure as hell are going after aggressively that that next generation of the cloud world managing multi SaaS. I mean, look at Gartner. The the SaaS numbers compared to everything else are just ridiculous. I mean, it's a beast. It's only getting bigger. And man, this stuff is getting more and more complex to manage. And if you want that service desk to deliver on those managed services, you know, do, do remediation, you got to get them something easy to use and push button and heavily automated. And ideally, if you could marry all those things together, that's, uh, I, would, I would not want to compete against that company. 